This episode is brought to you by Roundtable Group, the experts on experts. We've been connecting attorneys with experts for over 25 years. Find out more at roundtablegroup.com. So hello and welcome to Discussions at the Roundtable. I'm your host, Michelle Lux. My guest today is Dr. Eric Cole, a cybersecurity expert witness with over 30 years experience. He started out as a CIA professional hacker, was part of the Commission on Cybersecurity for President Obama, and consults with Fortune 500 companies. He has his own podcast, Live as a CISO, Become a World-Class Chief Information Security Officer. So be sure to check that out for some great tips and information. And thank you, Eric, for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You interviewed with the CIA kind of out of college and, you know, you just happened upon cybersecurity. It was in its infancy. You guys didn't really know if it was going to lead to something because it was kind of new. Little did everyone know that cybersecurity be so huge. Um, but you took a risk kind of going down that path. And then that led to you to become a professional hacker. Is this where you got introduced to being an expert witness or did that come later? So expert witness actually came uh, later, probably about 20 years into my career. So as you said, professional hacker for the CIA. And then I left the CIA and realized that I also like building and growing companies. So I built and grew many technology companies and networking, cybersecurity, and other areas. And then about 20 years into my career, I get a call from an attorney that said, we need somebody with industry experience. And I thought, wow, aren't there a lot of experts out there that have that? And the reality is most experts are college professors. And college professors are great, right? They have the foundational knowledge, they have uh, the credentials, they know how to speak. But in some cases, having industry experience where you actually have to talk about what happened in 2005 or what happened in 2010, that's a little more rare that's harder to find. So in this case, they needed somebody who had expertise in cybersecurity and firewalls from 2001. And because I've been doing this since 1991, uh, that pay, played into my advantage. So I actually worked on the case and just really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was really fun because I'm a natural born teacher. And what I love about being an expert is you have to take very, very complex topics and explain them in a way that a non-technical judge and jury can understand. And to me, that's just such a challenge that I really enjoy and love doing that of how can you still get the facts across without losing any of the details, but do it at a higher enough level so they can actually understand to make an appropriate decision. What type of matter was your first case? The, the first case was actually a patent infringement okay. case, uh, which normally, uh, you would utilize college professors for, but in this particular scenario, they needed to be able to talk about what was happening in the industry during that time period. Because in this specific scenario, they really needed help on proving and showing the validity side. They, mm -hmm. they really needed help showing that it was novel and unique. And this had to do with technology like firewalls, and intrusion detection systems. And the issue is those terms have been around for a long time. So if you just did a prior art search, you would see firewalls from 1990 and that created problems for them. So they needed somebody with industry experience to say, no, 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 this entity when these patents didn't invent firewalls, they didn't invent intrusion detection systems, but they did invent a unique way of combining them together to detect a very specialized types of attack. So I was really good at sort of getting into a narrow area to be able to differentiate it from the prior art and be able to show that it was novel so that uh, the patent was valid. And then we can go in and move to the infringement side of the house. What do you wish that you knew um, back then that you know now to make it a little bit easier for you to be an expert witness? To me, probably the biggest thing I wish I knew was a little more of what the attorneys are dealing with from their perspective. Because it's easy when you're coming in with an expert that, that I, you just assume that they have a plan, they know everything, and that you're the only expert they have to deal with. But, but in reality, when I realized how much other work the attorneys have to do, like they're filing complaints all the time, they're doing so many other things that really they need an expert that really can 
coordinate with them, but run a lot with the baton. And that was something in the beginning is I would sort of keep waiting and waiting and waiting for, for the attorneys. And then you get the phone call of, okay, Eric, so how's the report going? And you're like, what report? And they're like, uh, the report that's due in 48 hours. And you're like, I didn't know there was a report that was due in 48 hours. And you go back and forth and you realize that, yes, they forgot to notify you. But the reality is, I forgot to reach out and notify them. So to me, the whole approach that I take today is more, what can I do to make their life as easy as possible? So when I first start a case, I try to get the entire schedule mm -hmm. of when is fact discovery end, when are reports, because I know how busy they are. So this way I have a team that can then stay on top of it. So now we're getting, and we just had this happen where we have a report that we thought was due January 15th. So we reached out and the, the lead attorney was like, oh, no one contacted you yet? And we're like, no. And they're like, oh, we thought somebody was already working with you on the report. So it ended up what could have been a fire drill because of the holiday season, we were able to get in front of. So that's really my big thing is, is really do as much as you can to run alongside the attorneys, get the schedules. And what I find that makes sort of world-class expert witnesses you really need to be the program manager. You really need to manage and run the program. And I know that's not my skill set. So that's why I have a team, right? So, so I have a team that basically, okay, your sole focus is to make sure we're on track. We manage the schedule. We help out the attorneys. And then the other big thing I found is don't be afraid to suggest alternative approaches, right? Because yes, typically when an expert comes in, you're a little late to the game in terms of the attorneys have a strategy, they know where they're going and they know how they want to approach it. So I would always just, okay, that's the road you want me to go down, I'll go down it. But I'm realizing today that it's sometimes helpful to say, okay, I'm fine with going down this road, but did you think of this road or this road or this road? And then you end up getting some other options. And, and this happened in a case that went to trial where I brought up a few additional infringement scenarios to the uh, original ones, and it ended up working out because the original scenarios actually got thrown out for some legal issues. And if we didn't have those backup scenarios, we would have been dead in the water. And because of those backup scenarios, we were able to get a very favorable verdict for our clients. So it's always good to sort of be creative and suggest other ideas. Did you have a mentor to help you navigate being an expert witness? Uh, I, I wish I did, uh, but but unfortunately, no, because. Uh, everyone I talked to thought I was crazy to do expert witness work because they're like, Eric, it's hourly work, right? You, you, you always sell products and services that basically are fixed price because of your expertise and how you deliver that by doing fixed price, you can get much higher margins. You need to stay away from hourly work, right? So if anything, my mentors told me not to do it, but I always love to try new things. And like I said, I just enjoy the challenge. It's like, to me, the ultimate chess match and being able to explain topics that from a business standpoint, it doesn't make sense. But from an enjoyment and be living my purpose, it makes a lot of sense to, to do it because I really like it. So that's why I go down the route. However, in doing the work, you start meeting similar experts Sometimes you're you're on the same side, sometimes you're not. So over the years, I have built up what I call more colleagues that do expert witness work that I've either known previously or met through the litigations, and we've become friends. So now we sort of can help each other uh, back and forth. Now, once again, never reveal anything from a PO or anything sensitive, but it's just sometimes nice going, hmm, with this strategy or that strategy, which way do you think we should go? And a great example is, we had a case recently where I did not only infringement, I did validity, and I did apportionment. The other side was saying that because I technically did the role of three people, they wanted three days of depots. Because you, you know you get seven hours in, in federal court, you get seven <laughs> hours. So they, they wanted three days in a row. And the attorneys I was working with basically negotiated that instead of three days of seven hours, we could do one day of 11 hours. And I'm like, 
okay, that's sort of like, where do you want to be shot? Right. I'm like, I really don't want you to shoot me. I mean, neither one sounded appealing to me. So I sort of reached out to some of my colleagues and I'm like, well, what do you think? And they were all like, Eric, you've done multiple day depots. We've done it. It's very, very exhausting. We would recommend we've done long depots that once you get into it, you sort of get going, the energy flows, it's work. So, so they actually convinced me to do the one day of 11 instead of the three. And it ended up, uh, after you got to about hour eight, the last couple of hours just went by so quick that it ended up being really well. I stayed in the zone. The attorneys were very happy. So that's an example where if I didn't have those colleagues that did an 11 hour, that sounded so grueling. I probably would have picked a three day, which in reality would have been more grueling at the end. So it's always good to have folks who have done those things to bounce the ideas off of. Your attorneys probably knew the positive spin of having a long one day depot versus three days. That's exactly it. The attorneys wanted the one day, but they were like, Eric, we understand that's a big ask. So, so they were sort of also suggesting that because yeah, as you said, if you do three days, you're giving them time to basically listen to what you said yes, and have 12 or 15 hours to, to come up with a whole new set of questions and uh, go at you again and then again. So yeah, the attorneys really wanted the, the one day depot. The one thing they didn't like that I didn't like either was I'm like, if we're doing 11 hours, it should be one attorney and me and it should be marathon. But the judge, because it was different topics actually allowed them to switch attorneys. So I'm like, wait, this is like your tag team in cage match here. And I'm the only one on my side. But but once again, it worked out well. But yes, you're right. The attorneys were also sort of pushing in that direction. So that played a big role where you always want to trust the attorneys too, because ultimately they have the best interest of the case, which is what you ultimately want to. You also touched on uh, where you have learned along the way that you are more proactive, maybe in your approach of what you're presenting to the attorney for different ideas, right? Have you found that most attorneys will give you that that pre-trial prep where you guys sit down, it's a, it's a mock back and forth, uh, they prepare you for the other side. Do you usually get that or do you have to ask for that? It's interesting because most of the time uh, I do have to ask for it. So they will always going into trial, will always go in and uh, prep you for your direct. But a lot of times I have to ask and be very persistent on preparing for the cross. Because we know when you're going into trial, if you've done trials before, and I've done a lot of these, the, the, the direct is very straightforward, right? It, it's very straightforward, it's, it's easy. It's you wanna make sure you know what you're not thinking about and the angles. Now, of course, I always read my deposition transcripts and there's a lot of prep work I can do, but I'll always push back and always say, hey, can we please have another attorney just do a mock cross and just make sure I'm ready and just make sure I'm consistent? Because to me, the biggest thing I found, which is easy to say, but hard to do when you're in the courtroom, is you want how your tone your voice, your pace, that you're doing your direct to be exactly the same as it is for the cross. And it's easy to say, but it's hard because you can can react because you know a lot of times with the jury, it's not what you say, it's how you react. Yes. So if, if they ask you a question on cross and you're... Uh, <laughs> you, and you can give a great answer, but but they're immediately going. But if, if you're just like we're having a conversation, they ask a really hard question like, yeah, that that happened. It really wasn't a big deal. And we moved on. So I find that the mock cross is a lot more about me just being able to keep the same tone and just practicing keeping the same expressions and the same answers and the same body language, as opposed to what they really ask in the mock. But that's why I really like the mock. Essentially, I joke, yeah, I, I want somebody to be aggressive and yell at me, and I just want to stay calm, cool, and collective. So, so to me, that's really more the practice of the delivery than actually what you have to say. Well, how do you prepare your expert witness reports? Do you memorize them in preparation for deposition or testimony? Yeah, so the writing the reports, the big thing I always like to do is really understand the case 
and then make sure that I have multiple pieces of evidence. Because I, I found early on where I, I remember one of my, I think it was my second or third case, great report, but I relied on only a couple pieces of evidence. And one of them, basically, they admitted was incorrect. So, so the other side basically said, yeah, th this is wrong and this is incorrect and it's not accurate, which is a whole nother issue for the lawyers to handle. But then I was in a very hard position because you know you can only testify what's in your report. And if the one document you relied on is now questioned, th that put me in a hard spot. So now I always have the philosophy of you don't want to overdo it, but I like to have uh, some public documents, some private documents depositions from the other side, and depending on the case of source code is available. So in my reports, what I'm really focused on is for any argument, if it's a trade secret or infringement or whatever I'm working on, that I have multiple sources that all say the same thing. And, and this way, if there is a problem later on, I can say, okay, the document gets thrown out, no problem. I have a, a deposition, I have another document, or I have source code that I can use. And that's another thing that I do when I'm writing my report. I also go in and come up with questions that I would like count my the counsel I'm working with to ask the other side during depositions. Because so, sometimes you're in situations where depots are taking place as you're working on the report. So if I can get in front of that where, okay, you're deposing one of the lead engineers in two weeks and my report's due in five weeks, it would really be great if you could get this, this, and this for me, because those are areas that I'm pretty sure work this way. I have some documents, but it's not as strong as I would like. So if you can ask those questions and, and get uh, accurate sound bites or admissions for me, that would really help supplement the report. So that's the other thing that I really look at is just trying to get as much supporting evidence and then organize the report in a way that makes it very easy for me to reference it during a deposition. Because most of the reports I'm doing are fairly technical. Average report size is 500 pages. I was just, this is very timely. I was deposed yesterday. Uh, so so if I'm a little, a little out of it, that's because I just came out of a, uh, that, that was a nine hour because it was ITC. So the attorney had seven but then the government attorney got whatever time they needed. So it was a seven plus, plus, plus on that front. But uh, in that case, that was a 1700 page report. Wow. So th there's no way no. you're going to be able to memorize or know that. And to me, the most important thing is uh, in a deposition, while you do want to make sure you're looking at the report and you're using the time wisely, I mean, clock management's important. But on the other hand, you want to make sure that you're not abusing it or overdoing it where they could go back to the court and say, Eric took 20 minutes to answer any question. He didn't even know what was in there. So I'm very, very big on organizing table of contents yeah. and making sure that the right information is in the right sections. And then you asked about memorizing for a deposition. Uh, absolutely not, because we know it's way too much information. And with seven hours, there's no way you can memorize. And especially the last two hours when you're tired, if you try to go from memory, I feel like we should play from Top Gun, fly into the danger zone, right? <laughs> that's like the danger area. So, so that's when I tend to take more breaks and I really go in. So when I prep for a depot, it's really more about knowing where everything is as opposed to memorizing it. Okay. Now, trial is different because you, you know when you go into trial, your report is scoped down a lot. You, you're normally gonna drop some of the claims or drop some of the patents because most trials these days, especially coming out of COVID, the judges are really limited. Like before COVID, I would work on cases where, oh yeah, we have 40 hours and we can take four hours on your direct. Now, just had a trial three months ago, where they're like, Eric, you have a lot to say, but our entire case is 12 hours. So you have to get your entire case, which should have been a three hour uh, direct into an hour. So it's like, okay, you really got to condense it down. And in those cases, to me, you really need to know your report and memorize it. Now, if on cross, they ask you some weird question 
the reports there. But you, you know, a, dep a depo, if you're looking up every question, no issue. But if you're in front of a jury or even a, a bench trial and you have to look up in the report that doesn't come across really well and has a negative connotation. So, so depots is, is all about using the report and testimony is knowing the core arguments solid that you can get through most of it, if not the whole testimony, even the cross without having to look anything up. Yeah. I mean, it's daunting and it sounds exhausting, but at the same time, thrilling, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Let's talk about what types of, of like cases, um, do you do mostly just the patent side of it and the corporations, or do you work on like the defense side or the plaintiff side mostly? Which which one do you kind of end up with? So if we go back 10 years, a lot of the work that I did was in uh, patent cases in cybersecurity. And it was probably the, the first several years I did it around 60-40, so 60% was on plaintiff work. So mainly doing infringement, uh, sometimes doing validity and apportionment, and then uh, would do the other 40% on defense work. Now it's more about 75, 25 on patents, where because uh, I'm really good on the infringement side and proving the infringement as opposed to discrediting somebody else. So uh, most of the work's on that. But in the last couple of years, we're getting a lot more trade secret cases. We just earlier this year, six months ago, uh, Appian versus Pegasystems, we had the largest verdict in the history of Virginia, a $2.1 billion uh, trade secret verdict. And I was uh, the sole testifying expert for the plaintiff on that, that front. So uh, that's one where industry experience is critical, right? If, if you're a college professor, there's no way you can opine on proper protection measures in 2009. So uh, after that case, yeah, I'm getting a lot more on trade secrets because I just have that experience and expertise. Uh, breach cases, once again, requires a lot of industry experience. So we're getting a lot more breach cases. And then on the patent cases, while we are still doing infringement and validity, what we're finding is one of the big problems in a lot of these cases is you have infringement, and you have your economist with damages, but you need an apportionment expert to bridge the gap. You need an apportionment expert to say, okay, yes, they infringe, but it's not 100% of the product. Right? It's 70%. So you have to take a product and say, okay, it's broken down into these pieces and these pieces and these pieces. So the infringing technology is 20% of the overall product. And then you can give that to the economist so they can run their numbers. But the economist doesn't have the experience to do that. And most infringement experts that are college professors don't have the industry experience. So we're getting a lot more work in that area. And that was four months ago in uh, Symantec versus, sorry, Columbia versus Symantec. I, I almost flipped around uh, Columbia versus Symantec. I was their apportionment expert, and that was over 200 million dollar verdict in that case. So we're also seeing more and more work on the apportionment side because that's one where based on the industry experience of being an expert witness, I'm a bit of a unicorn where most people don't have those two things that they can put together. Now, do you work mostly in US courts or do you go overseas? Do you have China, you know, Europe? Are you asked to be an expert over there? It's mainly US. We have had a couple of cases in Canada. We are doing a few cases because if you know cybersecurity, a lot of the startups and a lot of the technology comes from Israeli-based companies. So we are going in and, and working a little bit overseas. We had a few cases in Europe and Germany, but most of the cases tend to be in the U.S. And then, as I mentioned, we are getting more into regulatory cases. So with the FCC and FTC, we've done some cases there. We're also starting to get into some of uh, ITC cases where it's not about damages, but blocking uh, the importing of the products into the country. So, so we, we're dealing with international matters, but most of them are involving international matters within the United States. Sure. Now, do you also find that um, when you do work through another court, you know, every country is a little different with the legal system. Have you been prepped for 
the approach of how you are an expert in another country? Is there that guidance there or that understanding when you're maybe retained? Yeah, yeah that, that's one I I always uh, push a lot on. I want to ask a lot of questions just to make sure I'm I'm fully prepared. Like, or in in some cases, uh, experts are not allowed to testify. It's only the expert report. Mm-hmm. So in mm-hmm. those cases, you're going to write it completely different. Yes. Because normally you want to write an expert report, very technical, and cover every option. Because if it's not in the report, you can't testify, knowing it's going to be whittled down. But if that report is your testimony and is the only thing the judge is going to read, you're going to write it totally different. You're going to have to write it in a different language at a high level and other areas. And then the other big thing I found with international is it's uh, in depositions, they're often allowed to have multiple attorneys. So I, I I had one case in Canada where it ended up, I think it went on for three or four days because not only there was no time limit, but there were seven different attorneys that all questioned me. So that's a whole different ball game when, when one's going and another one could jump in and they could tag team. And it, it, I mean, you, you're at a much different level of exposure than when it's just one-on-one. And the strategy is different because if, if one attorney is taking your depot, you understand sort of how deep they can go in their knowledge. So you can use that to tailor how you approach the depot. But if there are seven, right now, okay, this person isn't technical. So if I go, go technical, I can't use it to my advantage because guess what? Another person's going to jump in who's more technical. So you just have to be a, a lot more different in the strategy and how you answer the questions. And that's once again, just really working with the attorneys and making sure you're really understanding and asking a lot of questions. Because as I said, attorneys are very busy. So they'll sort of give you a quick prep and assume that you're ready if you only ask questions. So I find the trick as an expert is to use the time wisely, but have really good questions. So how does this handle in this country? How we handle that in this country? And make sure that you ask a lot of questions and take the onus of being prepared on you and not put it on the attorney. Now, because of your background with the government um, and the regulatory that you're going into now, do you find that the government is coming to you to use as an expert witness? Because usually they stick with their own, unless you're an outside contractor and whatnot. Have you been retained from the government side to be their expert? Uh, Yes, I have. So I've worked with uh, the FCC and the FTC on those cases. And that's one that's more of strategic business where I like to know both sides. It's important to be able to say you've worked on both sides, you understand the strategies and how they work. But but the big challenge is as I get more and more experience, and as my rate gets a little higher and higher, right? Uh, the, the government has a lot more financial restrictions. So in a lot of cases, we have to uh, either work out a different deal or provide different rates or things like that to be able to get that work. So for us, it's much more strategic where the government wouldn't use us on a regular basis just because of uh, some of the rate issues. But on the other hand, if they're the right cases that are interesting and right within my sweet spot of expertise, I will decide that, yes, this strategically makes sense to take those cases. So we do get reach out a lot. We, we're more selective on those cases, but we do try to balance them out. Um, AI is just trending right now. Do you find that that is, is changing the landscape for you and in your world and your business, um, where the technology is going now? And is it shifting like your requirements of how you respond to it? So yeah, AI is definitely one of those that are on my radar. But interesting enough, I haven't seen it really come that much into the expert witness case yet. So I, I think it's one where it's still fairly new and it hasn't got there, but that's one that we're we're keeping a pulse on that we're thinking is going to be pretty hot probably in another two to three years. And then the other one that is like, as we speak, is getting hot is on the cryptocurrency because my PhD is in cryptography. So we've sort of tracked that, done some papers and presentations, anticipating that coming. And now we're starting to get more and more work on the cryptocurrency side. Is there one last story that you would like to share just as your experience as an expert witness that was... um, you know, challenging or insightful or help through you? 
The only one I would end with is uh, I, I was testifying in a in Virginia federal court on a patent infringement case, and it was a, a lead attorney that I worked with many many times, and me and him both are very engaging. And we do have a script and we, we are prepared, but we sort of ad lib a little bit. And it was a Friday afternoon. The courthouse was a little warm. And basically, uh, when the other expert finished right around two o'clock, like you can see the jury was just done, right? It was a long trial. It was one of those courts that went from eight to five. And I come up at two o'clock, there's uh, still three more hours in the day. And the jury is just like ready to go to sleep. And uh, the, the lead attorney, I see him basically take our script and he looks at the jury, he looks at the script and he flips it over like he's not going to use it. And he gives me a look like, you ready to go? And I'm like, <laughs> let's go. And, and, and we ended up just, it, it was just a lot more. And it's funny because everyone who saw me goes, Eric, that was the most relaxed we've ever seen you on that front because it was I got to just get in the element and basically just tell the story and go through it as opposed to cover prepared components. And then th this is a part I don't like, uh, but but I do like for my client is after my testimony, uh, that evening, the lead counsel for the other side uh, ended up having a heart attack being put in the hospital. And then uh, the case ended up settling. So we weren't able to uh, finish the testimony because the case settled in favor of our clients. So, so that's one of those where I definitely wish that didn't happen. And I definitely wish uh, they weren't put in the hospital, but it was just one of those wild cases where sometimes if you just sort of go from within and, and trust your instinct, you get some really good results for your clients. So that was one of those wild rides where it's like, we're, we're getting done on Friday. And we're going in, okay, we got to prep to get ready for uh, Monday. And then you're hearing all these medical issues and other things. It was just, it was one of those crazy things. I remember sitting there on Saturday afternoon going, what just happened? It, it, it felt like five weeks compressed into a 24 hour period. Right. But fortunately, the part of the story I always like telling is uh, the attorney uh, ended up being fine. He's super healthy. And uh, as things progress, I ended up working with him on a few cases later on. So, so it ended up all being a net positive. But that was probably one of the craziest, wildest cases that I worked on. You just never know what to expect. Uh, well, thank you, Eric, so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Michelle. And it was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Discussions at Roundtable. Our show notes are available on our website, roundtablegroup.com. Subscribe today on Apple Podcasts or your favorite listening apps.